2-0 hole. <laughs> We're all knotted up now, and we have a best of three series in the Eastern Conference Finals. Welcome to NBA TV's post-game coverage. We'll take you back out to the queue. You'll hear from the coaches and players at the podium with a pair of NBA champions, Steve Smith, the Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas. I'm Jared Greenberg. We, we've got a lot to get to here. LeBron goes for 44 points, and now two wins away from his eighth consecutive trip to the NBA Finals. Meanwhile, the Boston Celtics, one in six on the road now in the 2018 playoffs. And by losing in this game tonight, guaranteed that they have to go back out onto the road to the queue for game six. Lost by 30 Saturday. What did you see tonight by the Celtics, who again trailed by as many as 19? Well, I, I, I see Cleveland has, has really taken control of the series from a confidence standpoint. And it really started in game two. Even though the Celtics won game two on their home floor, Cleveland was up, you know, 20-plus points in that game. They was up 20-plus points in the third game. And they were up, you know, 20 tonight. You know, so at some point in time, Boston's got to figure out a way to get close. Because the last three games, you know, even though Cleveland, again, lost game two, they have really had control of, of, of the game. And going back to Boston for game five, that's going to be a very tough game for the Celtics to win. They still have the advantage because they're playing at home, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a tough game for them to win, Smitty. Yeah, you're totally right. I, I think right now T. Lou has done a nice job. He's figured some things out, and I think for them is getting off to these bad starts. Uh, there might be a lineup change for the Boston Celtics. Maybe Marcus Smart put them in a the game or maybe Aaron Baines, but I think right now is Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are not playing well at the same time. Yeah. Love to see if both those guys can play well at the same time. And I think the Celtics right now selling for too many contested jump shots. I mean, 28 threes they took. I know they were down, but I think they're going to have to find a way to drive it, get, maybe get to the free throw line, and get into that paint a little bit more. And, you know, young, young guys, they, we as young players coming into the league, right, and, and we're watching the Celtics as young players, you have a difficult time understanding how to win on the road. Yeah. Right, you you can't be as carefree on the road as you are at home. So some of those some of those threes were were kind of rushed. They were kind of mm -hmm. early. A little bit more patience they could have had. And and that's just a learning experience in terms of learning how to win playoff games on the road. We'll get into the particulars with the offensive struggles by the Celtics. Uh, what the Cavs did, especially with Tristan Thompson. And again, we'll take you back out live to the queue and hear from both head coaches and players as they come to the podium in just a couple of minutes after the 111-102 uh, Game 4 win to even up the series by the Cavs. But, but I want to bring up this point for both of you who have been through a lot of playoff series. 2-2 is 2-2, no matter how you get there. But it felt a week ago like Boston was going to sweep this series, right? And then as soon as Game 3 happened and the Cavs and LeBron gets on the board, you feel like, oh, the momentum is back, and just like that. So even if it was a split in the first two games and then a split in the next two, does it really matter where, how we get to 2-2 in terms of momentum and looking forward in the series? Yeah, it does, because Isaiah said it best. Some people don't understand that, uh, and I totally agree. In game two, you felt like Cleveland had found their rhythm, how they were playing against the Celtics, even though they lost. I didn't feel like it was going to be a sweep. I figured they would go home, and obviously game three was huge, but they took care of business. And it would be tough for them to come out today unless they had somebody just knock down a whole bunch of unbelievable shots and got red hot. Back live on NBA TV, Cleveland has even up the series at two. We'll get more from the podium in a moment. First, as you see on our screen, it is the NBA Senior Vice President of Replay and Referee Operations, Mr. Joe Borgia. He makes me call him Mr. Joe Borgia, that is. Uh, Joe, got a couple plays from tonight to, to discuss. First, let's talk about a call from the third quarter. Marcus Morris uh, got whistled in a spot that, that oftentimes we... We, we see a no call. Can you take us through it? Yeah, Jerry, what you're going to see here is Morris is going to attempt a three-point shot. And Love comes over to defend it. Now, Kevin, when he goes up to sort of show on the shot, jumps clearly in front of Morris. He's not going to make any contact with him. But what you're going to see is Morris extend his right leg out to try to draw a defensive foul. Well, since Love was going to completely miss him, an offensive foul needs to be called on this play because Love is affected by the contact. Normally when you see the offensive player kick their leg out, the defender just plays through it. It doesn't affect their speed, quickness, balance, or rhythm. But since Love got knocked over, that makes the contact more than marginal. And that's why the offensive foul is assessed on this play. All right, Joe, reasonable explanation. We get you there. Let's go a little later in the game. 
uh, during a rebound. The ball knocked into the backcourt by Marcus Smart. The referee has then changed it from a backcourt violation. What was going on there? Well, you have a shot taken and a rebound. So, you know, the question is, does, does Smart actually get the rebound or not, which on this play is actually irrelevant. But the referee that makes the call, I believe he thinks Smart gets the ball, and as he falls down, he taps the ball into the backcourt, which would be a violation. But from this angle, you can see if he gets the ball or not. Thompson is the one who knocks it out of his hand. Now that makes it a loose ball, and in the NBA, a loose ball can be retained by the same team if it goes into their back court. Now in college, this would be a violation because it's whoever last touches it. But in the NBA, because Boston technically no longer has control of the ball since Thompson hit it, Boston is allowed to go back into the back court and get the ball without a violation. So I think the referee initially blew his whistle for backcourt and then immediately realized something just wasn't, you know, perfect on this and went over to his partner, uh, Scott Foster, who gave, who had definitive knowledge that the ball was knocked loose by Thompson and therefore they call an inadvertent whistle and give the ball back to Boston since they had it when the whistle blew. The Iron Man of the Replay Center. NBA Senior Vice President of Replay and Referee Operations, Joe Borgia. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll speak to you again tomorrow night. Thanks for having me, Jerry. It's now a best of three series. Uh, Steve Smith, Isaiah Thomas. Smitty, uh, what has Tristan Thompson done to affect this series, particularly for a guy like Al Horford, who we just saw? Well, I think in the first two games, if you see second chance points, I think it was plus 22 in the first game, and then obviously it was a plus, I think, 8 or 9 or 12, I'm not knowing the numbers, but in this two games in Cleveland, it's been the Cavaliers plus in the second chance um, category. Then I think also you look at just the activity of Tristan Thompson. Um, defensively, he's been fantastic, not just against Al Horford. I know everybody's keep talking about that, but those are plays right there he's made, blocking shots, the energy. He's playing like Tristan Thompson like two years ago where his activity has given teams problems. And I think he just in the right spot in the right time, and he helps LeBron James and also Kevin Love. I think it was a lot on Kevin Love playing that five spot to be able to score, rebound, and also kind of protect the paint. It gives him a little relief of having Tristan Thompson back there. Love struggled again tonight in game four, three of 12, but had a lot of foul trouble. But, I mean, Tristan seems like he's making the difference. Does that translate to TD Garden, or is this something that only happens at the queue? No, energy and effort, you know, it, it translates, you know, out on the road. And as a matter of fact, it translates better on the road sometimes than it does at home. And that's what he brings consistently. And, and Smitty, you said it, you said it best. You can't, you can't put a smaller player on Tristan. Mm. So you got to keep Hortford on him or you got to keep Baines on him. And because his activity is, is so constant and is so frenetic and almost you have to give up yourself to block him out. So a lot of times you end up face guarding him, which allows somebody else to go in and get a rebound. And his energy just wears you down, wears you down, sometimes more than scoring points. Quick note here on the Celtics, who we spoke a lot about during the pregame show. Speculation of a lineup change didn't happen. Brad Stevens went with the same starting five. Do you, were, A, were you surprised he didn't make one? And B, do you expect to see one before we get to game five? I, I thought Smitty, you know, hit it, hit it on the head in, in, in pregame when he, when he talked about, you know, Tristan Thompson coming in and, you know, and now... Horford's got to be on Tristan, and now that puts Morris on Kevin Love, which puts Jalen Brown, you know, on, on, on LeBron James. And, you know, not having those type of bodies where you can move them around as he effectively did, you know, as Brad Stevens effectively did in game one, you know, I, I think, you know, he's got to make an adjustment somehow to get his rotation back in line. Yeah, I think it's just some kind of way where you can have Al Horford matched up against Kevin Love, and also Marcus Morris uh, matched up against LeBron. I don't know who he'll take out of the starting lineup, but maybe it's just in certain veins a little bit earlier. But I think it's putting those guys, somebody, in foul trouble right. early when you have LeBron James going up against a smaller lineup when he knows he has two guys, that he doesn't have to be the guy that's rebounding, doing all the power forward work. He's playing a big small forward position yeah. right now, LeBron James, and he has advantage at that spot. I mean, you think about the numbers for LeBron, if you're Brad Stevens, you almost take the 44 points to say, okay, we can live with that. We love the seven turnovers, and we love the fact that he only got three assists. 
but they trailed by as many as 19 in this game. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, it's remarkable to think that every box you go to check with LeBron, they still find a way to win and, and won this one, you know, convincingly. Yeah, and, and what they, you know, we talk about, you know, adjustments, and they got to find a way to win the first quarter. Because if you look at the box score, right, you know, the Celtics won three out of the four quarters. The quarter that they didn't win is the first quarter. Right. And, you know, you could talk about LeBron James and, and everyone else, but that first quarter, the way you started the game, that's the thing that really killed you. And that's where they got to find a way to kind of neutralize it and keep it even, at least give themselves a chance. Yeah, the, the Celtics were a plus seven in quarters two through four in game four. You get yeah. behind by 19, it's hard to dig out of that type of yeah, hole. They, they limit the, the three-pointers hit by Cleveland. They maximize the turnovers, and you still fall behind that early, uh, that big. And 